Okay, hi everyone. So my name is Lisa Gonzalez. I'm coming to you from College of Southern Maryland. Um, and we're talking about making the connection with concept mapping, a versatile strategy for teaching, assessing, and evaluating clinical judgment. Well, I am very happy to be here with you guys today. Uh, we're going to talk about an active learning, um, teaching and learning strategy, concept mapping. So actually in honor of our active learning, we're gonna have some active learning and engagement as well. So there are a few ways that we can get interactive. I love the size of the group. This is a perfect size group um, is one, raise your hand, stop and ask me questions. Um, Sonia, would you be able to monitor when, if somebody raises their hand? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And then um, also put something in the chat. Like if you have a comment or a question, um, we're all educators. We have various expertise among us. It's so great when we can get together and have that collaborative reasoning and sharing. Um, and then also uh, we are going to kick over to an online interactive learning platform called Nearpod. So some of you guys, um, may use Nearpod already in your classrooms. It is an online um, presentation software, basically online uh, cloud-based. And um, it's similar to Kahoot. Sometimes I feel like Kahoot might be a little bit more popular. So I use it with my classrooms um, in, in lecture and the didactic, the theory portions. Um, and it's a way that you could do your presentation, but still have that student engagement. So what we'll do is you can connect basically from any device. You can connect with the device that you're working on right now. You can get your cell phone and connect, you know, and students, they all have cell phones these days. So it's really great. This is almost like in place of we um, use clicker questions at, um, in our program. So I use this in place of clicker questions now. They have their cell phone and then you don't have to worry about what they're doing on their cell phone. So if you guys can go ahead then, um, those that would like to join via Nearpod, uh, you go to join.nearpod.com. So I'm gonna pop this in the chat room. So you go to that website and then it's gonna oh, ask you that. to join a lesson and you enter this code right here, the M3SCY code. So you can join your pod and we have a few interactive, like, interactive, um, like collaboration boards, and then you'll see the presentation. If you're not in your pod, it's fine. You're still gonna see the presentation because I'm sharing my screen. And I actually, can leave those who are watching the recording later, there is a way actually to let people still be interactive with it. <clears throat> I could set that up after the session. All right, so it looks like we got a few people joining. All right, so let me go over to the learning objectives. Okay. So now we come to the objectives to the day. So basically the topic um, is concept mapping and the framework of developing students clinical judgment. So we're trying to use the teaching and learning strategy to help us connect and develop our students clinical judgment. Okay, so somebody asked about the code. Yes, um, it's at the top. So if you happen to get kicked out, it's always available at the top for you, just so you know, of the screen. But I'm gonna pop it in there too. So it's an easy copy and paste type of thing. Okay. So we really couldn't do the topic of concept map mapping um, justice with, without talking about some of the elements of clinical judgment. Cause it's important that we have that conversation about clinical judgment. And then it helps us to tailor our learning, teaching and learning strategies um, a little bit better. <laughs> And so we're gonna talk about how the two fits together. So that's our first learning objective. We're also gonna talk about how concept mapping can be a really versatile teaching uh, learning strategy. So what's great about, you know, as educators is a lot of times we're simultaneously doing teaching and learning strategies at the same time as assessment and evaluation. So um, concept mapping can do it all. Um, when we're going through, I'm gonna kind of tease it out a little bit and just talk about how it can be framed for the purpose of teaching versus you know, learning versus, you know, doing your assessment evaluation. 
And then you'll notice the last two um, uh, learning objectives are opportunities for us to engage and practice and share ideas um, about concept mapping. So first, just to get us kind of warmed up, you can practice using the collaboration board. Uh, what school are you coming from and what courses do you teach? You know, who are your students? Regina, what's the C and L program? Hi, I, can you hear me? I can. Um, C and L stands for Clinical Nurse Leader. I see a couple of my colleagues here. Tara is our program director. Um, and I thought I saw somebody else. Um, we teach in the, it's basically an entry level masters that leads to a clinical nurse leader certification. Uh Okay, so they come in and they do their undergraduate work and then transition to the leadership? No, it is all combined. It's a, um, they get an uh, NCLEX. I mean, they have to be prepared to pass the NCLEX, but along the way, they're taking master's courses so that after two and a half years, they are eligible to take the NCLEX and they're eligible to sit for certification to be a clinical nurse leader. Um, which is a specific designation or certification. Okay. Wow, they're learning a lot then. All yeah, at once, well, huh? We hope they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now that's a point we're going to get to today. <laughs> Teaching versus learning. <clears throat> oh, great. So we got a great representation, it looks like, from various areas. I love that we can just all come together real easy on Zoom. Okay, so we got our warm up. So when, you know, I'm a person that I love analogies and metaphors when I'm doing teaching and learning with uh, my students. And so I always think of metaphors and, you know, this picture to me is, you know, is significant and can represent teaching and learning. So I love the quote, education is all a matter of building bridges, building bridges with our students. But um, what I love about this picture is, you know, just how it can represent teaching and learning. So if you notice the hand, this bridge is held up by this hand. Um, and so you see pedestrians walking across and you know, as they're walking across, they're trusting that this uh, bridge is going to hold them up and it's gonna lead them to their destination. There's a clear path across, um, there's folks to enjoy the journey with, and they have faith that uh, putting one foot in front of the other is gonna get them some results. It's gonna lead them somewhere. Their efforts are gonna produce some results. So whenever I think of teaching and learning, I always think about how we cre can create these moments that are representative of this picture, how we can create a structure, you know, structured learning, clear goals that instills confidence in our learners and that how active teaching and learning strategies can really help support the learners and offer them opportunities for engagement and collaboration. Um, so all of this can create a symbiotic relationship of students and teachers actively engaged together in the learning process within a supportive curriculum. You, want, you kind of want your pieces there, your support there, and then you can just kind of guide them along the way to help them reach their destination. And I always say we can have a little fun along the way. So you'll often hear me share stories about the importance of creating a supportive uh, learning environment because you really can't or shouldn't um, separate the teaching learning strategy from the learning environment. So it's always in a context, you know, you got to think about, you know, the, um, the type of learning in the environment, how you, you know, can really facilitate that learning through the teaching strategy, they often go hand in hand, because really a teaching strategy can be a very lifeless approach without it. <clears throat> 
So then another piece to consider is what's our destination? So what are we concerned about these days as nurse educators? What's on the other side for us? Well, what's our goal right now in teaching and learning? Well, I think most of us are keenly aware that this next generation NCLEX is coming. And I think it has provided a lot of motivation for us as educators to um, do faculty development and also to consider what current teaching and learning approaches we have in our curriculum. And um, I see this motivating change for us, which can be really good and refreshing right now. Um, but another thing to consider then is preparation for the NCLEX, of course, cannot be the end all because after graduation, they take the NCLEX and then what? The new challenge begins, right? <clears throat> they begin their practice. So another journey begins for them, but are they ready for practice? So I always think then if the NCLEX were synonymous, really, really, you know, truly synonymous with practice readiness, then we would not have an identified preparation for practice gap. So for us right now, we're at the point where it really is crucial that we are having these conversations about developing students' clinical judgment, because both preparation for NCLEX and readiness for practice involves elements of ability to use clinical judgment. So then when we're, you know, looking at our curriculum, we want to look at opportunities that we're able to do that across the continuum, um, because we do know that clinical judgment and the ability to use clinical judgment develops over time with practice experience exposures. <clears throat> So we can use intentional teaching and learning strategies and these moments to help our students develop clinical judgment. <clears throat> so I wanted to bring your attention back to um, national survey findings. So um, me and a few of my colleagues, we came at to present at the NCLEX, uh, the Next Gen NCLEX Summit that kicked off these uh, workshop series. Um, that we had completed a national study that explored, you know, how nursing programs are implementing clinical judgment in the curriculum. <clears throat> well, one of the aims of the study was uh, to describe the types of teaching strategies that are used to promote students' development of clinical judgment. And on this slide, we actually have the, uh, the quantitative results from this aim. Um, there is a a manuscript one is going to come out, I don't know when actually, but it's in press right now in nurse education perspectives that talks about the whole study. And then we have a planned second um, manuscript where we're going to talk about the qualitative and quantitative findings of this. But if you'll look here, you'll see um, some of the teaching strategies that were most popular, one being case studies, simulation, and virtual technologies. Now, I will say this because it's like, wow, like we're all really, you know, using virtual technology. You know, we're in the next, you know, generation here. Yes, maybe or not. We actually completed this study at like the height of the pandemic. So we were all kind of in a position where we sort of had to figure out virtual learning, you know, but um. Yeah, so this is really a reflection of that moment in time. So these are some of the teaching and learning strategies that um, are used across the country. And concept mapping is sort of falls right in the middle there. So I kind of feel like sometimes it can be this underutilized strategy, but when um, you look in the literature, there's actually a lot of different ideas of ways to use concept mapping. So we're gonna talk about just a few of them here today. And hopefully, you know, you guys can share some of the ways that you've used concept mapping. So no matter what teaching strategies we're using, I just wanna emphasize um, a literature review done by Tayo and McCurry in 2019. I have all the references towards the ends too. So if you ever wanna to refer to any of them, um, they found that, uh, you know, they did a, a, a review of teaching and learning strategies. And um, they found that implementing them per usual is not enough to adequately develop students' clinical judgment. There were some key critical components that we had to consider and include for it to be more effective and geared towards clinical judgment. So again, if you think about it, I mean, it's not necessarily surprising to me because all of these different um, teaching strategies that we have here, we've been using them for you know, many different purposes, for many different, you know, for years and years and years, right? These teaching strategies, some of them are new, some of them new, but some of them aren't necessarily new ideas. But then we have um, 
this new emphasis on clinical judgment. So then it's like, okay, well, how can we take what we've been doing and then kind of tailor it and tease it and sort of make it align a little bit better with our, you know, one of our objectives is to develop clinical judgment. So, you know, so that's why it doesn't really surprise me necessarily that it's not just about doing things the way we've always done things that we have to give it a little bit of thought about how we, maybe we can update um, one of our uh, teaching strategies. So then I just wanted to bring up a few points again um, about teaching to promote development of clinical judgment. So one, and again, some of this stuff was found in the Tayo McCurry review. So one of the things they found was teaching strategies uh, to develop clinical judgment were more, more effective when you included a clinical judgment model, when you integrated a clinical judgment model. And um, it makes sense because, you know, clinical judgment involves uh, certain terminology, certain thinking components, you know, putting certain pieces together, um, you know, a certain way of thinking about it. And so when you have that clinical judgment model integrated into the teaching and learning strategy, then it really does help because you are using that language or you are framing it in a way that's going to help focus on developing those you know, individual components of clinical judgment, which leads me to the next point. So, you know, part of effective teaching and learning for clinical judgment involves attention to those cognitive components associated with clinical judgment. Because it's not just about, you know, telling your students like, okay, nurses think we need to make decisions. What else do you want to know? Well, there's all of this that happens in between the point of what are we thinking about? What are we deciding on? How are we making decisions, you know, to lead to clinical judgment? And then a third point is, you know, consider evidence-based practices. So are there any like best practices of implementing a certain strategy or using a certain strategy? So for concept mapping, I'm going to show you guys a few things that I found in the literature that um, seem like, you know, they're effective, they're good ideas. They use um, different evidence from, you know, what's known about teaching and learning, effective teaching and learning. Um, and then finally, to be able to link the noticing with the interpreting, responding, and reflecting. You might recognize this terminology. This is actually Tanner's clinical judgment model, um, uh, which I'm very familiar with. We use it um, in our uh, nursing program as well. And it's starting to be used throughout uh, different, you know, a lot of programs throughout the country use it. So that's the one that I always refer to for a reference. Okay. So concept mapping is an amazing teaching and learning tool because it really gets to the heart of thinking, the science of learning and cognition. This strategy has been used for more than 30 years in nursing education. Um, basically concept mapping, uh, according to a few sources, say it was created by Novak and Gowen in the 80s to help learners create a visual representation for concepts and ideas. Um, the origin of concept mapping comes from a constructivist theory, which explores how learning occurs as students construct, make meaning of knowledge. And another theory that's tied into concept mapping um, connects with the, uh, the simulation theory, which states that it's easier to learn by making connections. Connecting new knowledge with previous knowledge and frameworks is one way that students can make connection. And that learning also happens as students construct new knowledge and structures in their mind. So if you look here, what does cognition have to do with concept mapping? Well, a lot, because concept mapping really promotes retrieval of previous knowledge because the students are creating these maps, they're thinking about what they already know and bringing it in. Um, they're also, forming new pathways and frameworks because sometimes they have to rearrange pieces of their concept map or they have to look at it in a different way. And since the concept map creates a visual um, description of their thinking, then they're able to kind of see in a tangible format how they might have had the pieces already put. And maybe they have to kind of reconstruct it a little bit. They're also making meaning and interpreting between data points. Concept mapping is an active strategy. It's not just about putting data on a piece of paper, but they also have to think through how one piece of information connects with another one. Um, and then a concept map has a lot of pieces of information, a lot of different connections, uh, relationships are established. So really you're building this complex interrelationship between concepts. Um, 
Finally, oh no, another point is it promotes reflective thinking and evaluating ideas. So as the, after the students have built their concept map, it's good to go back and say, okay, now let's look at what you've built. What do you think here? You know, what test some of your connections? You know, what what relationships do you feel like you've established? So it gives it again, and it's reinforcing them thinking through that all over again, but it's also helping them self-analyze what they know what they might need to reframe, what they might need to relearn. And then also it facilitates knowledge transfer and sharing. So after you have this concept map done, then you can you know, engage with your learner. The learners can engage with each other, share their concept map. <clears throat> so information processing models, such as the one shown here, can be attributed to the work of Atkinson and Schifron and broadband in the 50s and 60s. Um, so information processing theories and models are very much tied up into clinical judgment. Um, so many, uh, you know, there's different models, like one of them is the clinical reasoning cycle by Levitt and Jones was actually um, built incorporating the information processing theory here. And um, this information processing theory also aligns with the, um, as a framework for National Council's um, clinical judgment measurement model, which is, of course is what they're using to help frame the new next gen NCLEX. So this is really important for us as educators to you know, become familiar with, to understand how this works a little bit because it is tied up with you know, the clinical judgment measurement model and clinical judgment models. <clears throat> so basically the question then is how does learning happen? And for us educators, how do we know learning has occurred? So the idea is that for learning to occur, then certain cognitive functions must be in place. So if you look here at the top left, you start with um, sensory input. Well, the student uses senses such as hearing or seeing. So maybe they're in lecture or lab and they hear us talk about forests. Then the information must move into working memory the short-term memory right here, and then finally into long-term memory, we're hope, hoping. So what we hope as educators is that we are teaching in ways that help the students move the information into long-term storage, so that way they can retrieve this information to answer test questions or to respond to patient care situations, for example. For us, when we're doing our test questions and when we're you know, talking with them in clinical, we'll seeing how they respond to patients for us in a way, that's how we are evaluating whether or not learning has occurred. And I know that sometimes we get a little frustrated sometimes because we're like, well, wait now, we have taught this and taught this and taught this content, but they don't get it on the test. You know, they're missing the test questions. They're, they're in the headlights when they're in clinical. So have they learned? Well, what might be happening when we have those kinds of moments is that students are not moving the information into long-term storage in meaningful ways. So then how can this happen then? Well, first the student must be attentive to the information and make meaning. So information processing theory really explains then you know, how this happens. And then when you understand, it's like I tell my students, if you understand the pathophysiology of a disease process, then everything else makes sense. You can build your nursing care from there. So same thing with our students. If we understand information processing theory and how learning, the science of learning, then because this is tied up with clinical judgment, it will help us be able to you know, use the teaching and learning strategies to really um, develop those cognitive parts of clinical judgment. So the, the information processing. Okay, so now back to students, they have to pay attention to the information, they need to make meaning of the information via the pattern recognition. And if they don't understand, it's really hard to move the information through to long-term storage. Now for information to be stored into the long-term memory, you need strategies that will help you. They need to rehearse the information, chunk the information, or encode the information. This is why active learning is so effective because students are engaged in the in processes that encourage movement of information from the short-term to the long-term because those active learning strategies really get to the heart of they're using the information rehearsing, 
chunking the information, they're putting it together in meaningful ways. Finally, learning is facilitated when new information can be connected with previously learned information. Linking the two is powerful. <clears throat> so again, just back to the model of clinical judgment about how some of this thinking comes together. You'll see elements similar to information processing. The nurse needs to notice, they need to make meaning of the information, and then they can respond and reflect on their response. <clears throat> We need to have, as a nurse, we need to have certain attention to the patient situation in order to notice, to receive the sensory input. The interpreting happens, which is grounded in what the nurse already knows, how well the, the nurse knows the patient, the pathophysiology, previous experiences, and mental frameworks that have already been formed. So what we're hoping is if we can help build students' mental frameworks, then it will make it a little easier for them to interpret and respond because they can recall, use that information. <clears throat> and appropriate responding relies on how well the nurse noticed and interpreted. So really to get to that response, you know, we have a lot of, you know, intervention questions in our exams, a lot of responding questions. And I always tell them, you can't skip steps. If you're jumping from, you know, read the question and hurrying up and just picking an answer just because it sounds good, you're not doing thinking and you're not going to do as well on these exams because you have to intentionally go through the noticing and the interpreting the information to choose the appropriate response. So that leads us to teaching. One area where I've spent time thinking about how to help students understand and learn these cognitive pieces involved in making clinical judgment is in this area. I thought about, you know, how can I better teach noticing, interpreting, responding, and reflecting? At first, I thought the thinking behind the nursing actions made sense and that students are just gonna, they'll just figure it out, you know? But then I soon discovered early in my career that that was not the case, that noticing required attention, you know, to uh, an awareness of, of certain aspects of the patient care situation and interpreting, you know, you kind of have to know how to figure out these relationships between the information. And that responding really, you know, is how do you know what the right intervention is, you know, and how that sometimes is tied into patient stability and, and whatnot, and also reflecting. So another thing that I learned is, um, you know, yes, yeah, students do learn this over time, but sometimes they struggle with a particular component, a particular cognitive skill. And I see, you know, what's involved in noticing, interpreting, responding, and reflecting is these different cognitive skills. And so sometimes I notice that certain students struggle with different cognitive skills. Um, you know, sometimes you might want to hone in on a particular piece of uh, clinical reasoning to help them get to the clinical judgment. So I just, I'm sure you guys have stories as well too, but one of the stories that really hit home to me that I was like, oh, wow, yeah, like I really need to like pay attention to like what component, you know, or what areas if, as far as clinical reasoning these students are struggling with. So I had a student one time um, in clinical, we had, um, we were getting ready for medication administration and we we're gonna ha hang an IV piggyback. And so, you know, you quiz your students, do they know what the medication is for and, and all this. And so, you know, I was quizzing the student and he was answering questions and he, he knew what the medicine was for. And, you know, he, he was interpreting great. He connected the medication with the reason the patient needed it. And he felt like it was the appropriate response. And we were talking about prioritizing and this is an antibiotic and this patient has this infection and he had all the checks. It was great. So went in the room, hung the antibiotic, you know, and things are going, you know, and I'm sitting here thinking like, all right, you know, this student's got this down. He's thought through this, you know, IV piggyback. This is what I like to see. I always like to see the clinical reasoning behind the actions. And so then next thing I know is, you know, this patient was a little confused. She starts getting kind of fidgety, you know, she's getting kind of fidgety and I'm just like, okay, well, what's going on here, you know? So I go over to the patient and I, I check her out and I pull back the sheets and the IV is hanging out of the patient, dripping all over the bed. And it looks like it's been dripping there for a little while because there was a primary bag of fluid going as well too. So I looked at the student and I said, did you, you know, assess your IV? And he, and he was like, no, I forgot. And I was like, okay, noticing we have, we have 
to start with noticing, right? We have to start with our assessment. And so we worked on noticing the rest of the semester because I noticed this um, trend with this particular student. So, you know, again, it was just like, all right, we really need to pay attention when we're developing our students' clinical judgment. Um, you know, this takes time. This takes experience and exposure, but it also takes an awareness of these individual pieces of clinical judgment. And then that's when I started learning how to tailor these teaching strategies with some of these various components. So I've done a little bit of talking. Now I would love to hear from you guys. What have you noticed about your students' clinical judgment development? Because that's really going to lead us into tailoring using these concept mapping strategy in a really effective way for us, tailor it to our students' needs. So I'll give you guys a few minutes to kind of think about this question. Feel free to put it in the chat or the collaboration board here. And while you guys are doing that, I'm going to kind of catch up on the chat a little bit, get some water. And you guys should, I think you guys can also read each other's comments too. And you can always heart them if you like. I always tell my students, they can heart each other's comments. They usually like that. <clears throat> So I love some of the things that you guys are coming out with. I hope you're able to read each other's comments. A lot of the thinking is occurring after these learning moments. That's really powerful, isn't it? The, the power of reflection. So I love how some of you guys are talking about you use debriefing techniques and um, to really bring that in because it's almost like it could be a lost learning moment, right? If a lot of the debriefing and the, you know, if a lot of the putting these pieces together happens after the learning moment and we don't capitalize or capture that. And that's why journaling is nice and debriefing and those kinds of strategies. Um, Eva, do you mind sharing about art gallery rounds? Sure. Sure. I uh, read an article in Nurse Educator and I'm trying to get the reference now. It's, it was Victor. Um, Victor 2021 Art Gallery Grand Rounds. And what they did was they had uh, like a piece of art and I think they did it in um, like in person at a museum, but I did it um, with a picture for the class to look at. 
And then they just take a couple minutes. They, they're in groups and they just take a couple minutes. Nobody says anything at first. And then they're just noticing. And then they talk about, you know, for another um, couple minutes, they talk about what they noticed within themselves, within their groups. And it was really amazing um, what they came up with because my thoughts about the picture, it was something silly I drew was totally, my thoughts were totally different than what all the students came up with and they really enjoyed it. Oh, I love that. I've heard, I was, I gotta look for that article. I've heard of it done in um, the medical world to help doctors with their noticing skills. So I feel like that's really effective too. It's almost like you have to pause for a minute sometimes and to learn how to pay attention again. You know what I mean? Especially with so many things that distract us. So I love that. <clears throat> Let's see what else we have here. If anybody wants to share their thoughts, feel free to share. Oh, Tara, that goes right along with it. Students only focus on what's in front of them. It's hard for them to think beyond in a busy, loud, distracting clinical environment. Absolutely. That's why um, I, I I'm like you guys, I love debriefing. And so every chance I can, even in clinical, like I consider our conferences debriefing time. So I'll do like a mid-shift conference and a post-conference just to like pause the craziness, you know, and then take us away from the unit for a little bit to think and talk. Students are so excited about psychometer skills and tasks. It takes prompting from us to help them look at how knowledge and judgment fits in that skill. Oh, that's a good one too. So yeah, so much good stuff. Thank you guys for sharing on the collaboration board. Does anybody have any thoughts that they want to um, share here or capture with the rest of the group besides what we have? If not, I'll move on. I see some things in the chat. <clears throat> okay, so now let's talk about concept mapping. Okay, so what are the basic components of a concept map? All right, a concept map includes labeled nodes, links, and linking labels to describe the relationships. Directional links typically mean that one leads to another. Non-directional links is means that, you know, there's a relationship there, but it's not necessarily one thing happens before the next. These are the like the true components of a concept map. Now, some scholarly sources will state firmly, like if it doesn't have this, it ain't a concept map. And but there's other formats that have kind of evolved a little bit from this. Like um, mind mapping is is one of them that's a, that's um, you know similar to concept mapping. Um, for the purposes of what we're doing, um, I'm going to share you know things that you know our concept maps, but you know, we're educators, we get creative sometimes. So basically it's always about the principle. So how do these things promote, you know, thinking skills? How do these things promote um, clinical judgment? That's what we wanna focus on. So here I have an example of a concept map, one that my student, one of my students have done and they gave me permission to share. I'm going to actually pull up the picture of it though to make it a little bit easier to see. There we go. You guys see that? So I will enlarge it just while we're talking about it. So there's um, concept mapping helps organize thoughts and represents knowledge. So this is like a bunch of information that the students have in their brain and they're able to like dump it down on a piece of paper in a way that makes sense to them. So this is how they're thinking right now. Um, concepts or topics are represented in circles or boxes. So usually, you know, you've got your topics in, you know, your concepts slash topics slash ideas in like the boxes. So we have inadequate nutrition, morbid obesity, diabetes, impaired healing. So there's lots of different ways to do concept mapping. So one of the things that I like to have my students um, connect with because of how it's placed in the curriculum in clinical, which I'll show you guys later, I like them to start with um, uh, like a, a problem the patient has, a medical diagnosis or a reason that they came in. And then I want them to bring in their assessment data. And 
try to figure out, does it connect? How does it connect? Like, because these are complex patients. We have complex human beings that we're dealing with. So like, how does all this information relate to one another and does it? I have them freestyle because I want them to see, you know, I want to see what structure they have in their mind. And um, so in this example, uh, this student was trying to make sense of a lot of different assessment findings. They were trying to figure out how the assessment findings might fit together. Um, this was an intense process for the student because there was a lot of different findings. Um, the patient had diabetes and cellulitis um, and an ulcer and acute kidney injury on top of all of it. So they wanted to see if there was a relationship between them and, and what type of relationship. Um, the task for the student was to determine what piece of information connected with what, and then I always tell them to explain their significance. So if you look on the sides, you start to see some narrative right here because um, I don't want them, you know, that's part of concept mapping. So concept map has the, um, the, the nodes, the, you know, the data, the links, directional links, and then some type of explanation or, or labels that explain the relationships between them. So on the side, because they ran out of room, they started to explain some of the relationships between uh, this information. So by rehearsing this information and putting it on paper, talking about it, they were able to hopefully, I'm, you know, we're practicing rehearsing and chunking. We're hopefully storing this information in a uh, long term in a meaningful way. And an important piece is that you can also check the connections or clarify any misunderstandings so they don't store the information incorrectly. Okay, so how can you use concept mapping as a teaching strategy then? Well, I have a few examples, but these are not limited. I'm hoping later you guys can share some of your examples. One activity I like to do with my students is to unpack complex concepts during lecture. Sometimes when you're watching your students, you can see that they're confused or they have curious looks on their face. They just don't get it. Some of the learners need to pause to go through that step-by-step -step complex um, concepts and see, see how things fit together. So this is a great activity for visual learners or for learners who need to take things piece by piece. So what I do when I see these confused looks is sometimes um, I will, you know, it depends on what you have in the room, but if I have a chalkboard or a whiteboard or something, what I'll do is I will build a concept map while we are talking and um, working through this uh, situation, this scenario. So one of the topics that I like to um, build is I like to, um, let me see. Let me stop share, reshare, see if I can find my whiteboard. I don't see my whiteboard, so I will use Nearpod's whiteboard. Okay, so one of the things I'll do is basically, you know, just like this, we, we're going to start talking about acute kidney injury. If I'm trying to help them understand how it connects with previous knowledge of dysrhythmias. So I'll start with saying, hey, you guys, we have acute kidney injury right in the middle here. All right, well, what are some causes of acute kidney injury? You know, so then I start talking about pre-renal or intra-renal or whatever. And I'm like, all right, guys, we have acute kidney injury and I want to bring back some dysrhythmia stuff that we did before. So we'll have, we only have so much space on here. So we have dysrhythmia. I'll just put a heart for now. Dysrhythmia content. All right. How do the two connect? So then they kind of think for a while, they're recalling previous knowledge. They're going back in their memory stores, trying to figure this out. Then somebody might say, Hmm, we well, use said acute kidney injury can be caused by perfusion, right? I said, I sure did. They're like, doesn't like dysrhythmia sometimes drop their perfusion? I'm like, they sure do. Which one? And they're like, let's go for the bad one, V-fib. I'm like, all right, we're going for V-fib. So we've got dysrhythmias and we've got V-fib. All right, are we connected yet? Yeah, let's connect it. No, we're not connected yet. What's going on with V-fib? Well, you know, this and that, and they don't have a pulse, right? I said, okay, good. We don't have a pulse, no pulse, no pulse. So I'll put that connection over here. What's happening when they have no pulse? You know, and keep challenging, challenging. Eventually we get to, you know, low cardiac output, low perfusion. 
Now we have an acute kidney injury. Well, how does that happen? Well, there's not enough blood flow to the kidneys. So all the while, while we're talking about these concepts, I'm drawing this out for them. And I'm kind of like, you know, sometimes, you know, they're making this scenario, they're making really good connections, right? But sometimes they throw some extra stuff in here. And so I might put it over here or over here and be like, okay, do they connect guys? Challenge each other. Don't just say, yeah, sure, that connects. Challenge. How does it connect? If you can't explain how it connects, it might not connect. So that's one of the activities I do with them is while we're talking about a concept in class, I'll draw it out for them. <clears throat> All right, so let's see. Another thing is um, explore the interrelationship of concepts. So that kind of happens as well while we're um, building this. We're talking about how does this relate with what you've already learned? <clears throat> All right, so another thing that I like to do is summarize a concept, a hierarchical concept map flowchart. So I will put these types of things in various parts of the lecture. So let's say we just started talking about neurogenic shock and I want them to understand how you get from point A through the complications of neurogenic shock. So I'll build something like this for them. These are pretty easy to build in PowerPoint. You can use a, um, what is it called? Oh, I forget what it's called, but there's a, um, a area in, in PowerPoint that will build these types of structures for you. Okay, so another strategy that you can use for concept mapping is in place of or to support um, uh, care plans. So in place of or to support care planning. <clears throat> So I'm actually gonna show you guys an example of that in just a little bit. And then another thing is it helps them prioritize uh, nursing care. So one of the studies that I wanted to refer to is Kadora. Kadora et al. completed a study where they had nursing students create a concept map each week of clinical. Then they used a concept map rubric based on the four aspects of Tanner's clinical judgment model. I'm gonna show you that part of the rubric a little later. The students review their concept map to see how well they noticed collected information, how well they interpreted the information, if the concept map helped them decide on an intervention, and overall they reflected on how the concept mapping activity helped with their clinical judgment. They found that participants identified that concept mapping helped them develop ideas for prioritizing care plans for the clinical situation. How it helped them use critical thinking skills to fully assess the situation and use clinical judgment skills to produce the best concept map. Participants reported that concept mapping also improved their decision making and cohesion in clinical. So it really can be used again to support your care planning because you don't want students just to necessarily put a care plan together and not know how it fits or how you would prioritize that care plan. So um, a few of these scholars, that's what they did, is they figured out then how they're going to use concept mapping to really promote that um, care plan. So here's one of them right here, um, Cook et al. So I know many nursing programs, including um, ours, we use care planning during clinical as a learning activity for students um, to help them manage their patient care. So Cook and her colleagues decided that they liked care planning but they felt like the current nursing care plan format that they were using wasn't really meeting their students' educational needs to develop critical thinking. So they wanted to do a better job at developing critical thinking. They wanted them to, the students to really understand better the interconnection of the patient's um, data points. So I actually have a bigger picture of this to show you guys. Um, just so you can see the structure here. So this, again, it's in one of the references. It's in the Cook et al. reference. So what the faculty did at the school is they had a conversation about moving away from a traditional care plan to use more of a concept mapping format. They still wanted to preserve the nursing process, so they developed the formatted picture right here. So basically in this picture, you see components of the nursing process still in a, a care plan, but instead they wanted that visual diagram. Um, so you'll see um, on the left is the legend and then on the right is where you see the different pieces of the care plan, but now it's in like a format more of a concept map. So that way students can kind of talk through 
the relationships here and how you get from one point of the care plan to the next point. So I thought that was pretty creative. Okay, so then concept maps um, are, can also be used as wonderful learning activities for students. Concept maps help learners recall existing connections, find gaps in their knowledge. It can reinforce previously formed mental frameworks while adding new information, or it can generate new understanding of relationships between information. The practice of recalling existing connections can help students reflect on what they already know. They can assess their understanding and learning. They can create a concept map, then recreate the concept map. So whiteboards are great tools because then they can just erase things and redraw it. <clears throat> no two concept maps look alike if they're generated from the mind of the student. And then they're constructing new knowledge while reinforcing the old. So one learning activity that students can complete is a group concept mapping activity. So I actually am gonna scroll over to this picture just to show you the steps of the group concept mapping activity. Um, and you can make this your own. You can, you know, it, hey, it's the Hegel article that they talk about it a little bit. They completed a study using this technique. But step one of the concept mapping activity is called generating ideas. So what you do is you pick a group leader who's gonna facilitate the conversation. You have a second person that's gonna take notes and then you give them a topic. So maybe it's congestive heart failure. So then the group, you give them time for brainstorming. So they're gonna just start jotting down everything they know about CHF, everything they know. It doesn't have to make any sense. It's just a bunch of different random ideas. Step two is when they structure the idea. So one of the recommendations um, that you could do for concept mapping is put these individual ideas on note cards, because then when the students are starting to structure the, um, the ideas, they can move the note cards around. You can give them like a table to work on, or you know if they have like a board that they could stick the note cards on, that they're trying to create these different structures of what you know they're starting to try to establish these relationships a little bit like okay well you know does edema fit in this map or, you know we've got a toenail infection does that fit no that doesn't fit so put that off to the side so they're trying in in step two they're trying to structure their ideas step three is now they've got some kind of structure so they've got their note cards organized in a certain way so now they're supposed to analyze the relationships between the data Okay, so we've got edema on the board next to CHF. Okay, great. How does that relate? What's the relationship? Why do we have edema? You know? So that's step three is to map and cluster these ideas. <clears throat> and then step four is to interpret the map. So you want to look at the overall thing and see if you have all the pieces there and if you have all your interpreting components there. Step five is to utilize the maps. So students, groups of students, after they put all these ideas together, they can present it to their fellow students. Now this process really should involve um, comparing the different concept maps that they come up with, um, critiquing. It's okay to be like, why do you have a toenail infection in your concept map about CHF? That's, I don't see how that belongs. Maybe they find something that they're critiquing that actually does belong, but they, the student, didn't realize the connection. So now they can get that knowledge from the other student. So it helps them really like refine their ideas. Um, concept mapping is also a great uh, study tool. So a lot of my students, they like to use concept mapping to create their own study tools. Now, sometimes they don't look exactly like what a traditional concept map looks like, but you know, so they got the basic format. So you can give them a template. I think I included this template as part of the resources, but um, this is actually a student created concept map template that said, yes, please use this. Um, I'd love to share this. So a lot of the students will use this type of format to break down different um, like disease processes that we cover in class. Sometimes it just helps them to have like a set format because then they always know where to find their symptoms versus their interventions. So this is a template that they gave me, but then here's uh, some examples of like completed concept maps. So this one is um, in the middle, they did hypovolemic shock, but this student in particular, they like to use different colors to like highlight, you know, to help them differentiate between symptoms versus like interventions, for example. This student said that the colors, the different colors help them visually remember the information better. 
Um, this is actually one student from clinical. We do concept mapping in clinical. So I'll share a little bit more about how we use concept mapping in clinical overall. Um, but I thought it was kind of fun. He did um, congestive, or not congestive, he did chronic kidney disease as one of his concept maps. So I'm actually gonna show you the bigger picture here, just cause I thought it was so well done. So, oh, that's too big. Yeah. So again, for my students, I always tell them, put the information in there, make the connections, and then write like a little phrase or a word or something that helps you explain your connections. Okay, now this slide um, is from the from our, our Gonzalez Nielsen Lasser 2021 article. What I wanted to show you here is how concept mapping fits with a clinical curriculum that emphasizes clinical judgment and reasoning concepts and topics. So a full description of the clinical reasoning um, uh, teaching method can be found in the Gonzalez 2018 article, but this table was published in the um, 2021. So the idea behind this was to teach the reasoning behind clinical judgment within the context of daily nursing care. So what I'm trying to get my students to learn is the practical part of nursing while at the same time they are learning the thinking behind the actions. So we break down clinical judgment one topic at a time and we really pay close attention to um, you know, the different components of Tanner's model, noticing, interpreting. <clears throat> so I wanna draw your attention to the data to diagnosis um, topic, which is towards the bottom. Um, each day we do a learning activity we, um, which helps students connect with the topic for the day. So on data to diagnosis day, guess what the learning activity is? Concept mapping. So this day lands on one of the interpreting days because I really feel like concept mapping, it does a lot of different things, but one of the things I feel like it really does well, it helps them learn how to interpret. So it really hits that part of the clinical judgment model interpreting um, really well. It gives them that practice to start understanding the significance of the data, the interrelationship of the data to help, you know, you see all this information, well, what does it mean? That's interpreting. Um, so that's when um, we do this concept mapping activity, but every week we do something. So this is just all the different topics from that. And then um, this is the lesson plan from the data to diagnosis activity. So you'll see, I wanted to show you this just so you could see how um, like uh, activity like concept mapping fits with the whole picture. So on the left side, it describes like the pre-conference questions, the warm up activities we do, the questions that I ask them in clinical. Um, then we have our mid shift conference where we will do our concept mapping activity. So I teach them how to do the concept mapping and then we do it together and then we share, we're kind of debriefing the patients because as they're sharing the concept map, we're really getting to the heart of what's happening with our patient. And then at the right side, you'll see we use Lasser's clinical judgment rubric an adapted version of Lasser's clinical judgment rubric as our clinical evaluation tool. So this is streamlined this whole teaching and learning process because Lasser's clinical judgment rubric is very much um, uh, connected with Tanner's clinical judgment model. The two really go nice hand in hand together because that was a Laster's intention. She was expanding a little bit more on the dimensions, the aspects of um, the clinical judgment model through her addition of dimensions. So we have concept mapping, which is honing in their interpreting. We use the nursing process. So we're going data to nursing diagnosis. And I want them to understand the interpreting behind that. So I know right now there's a lot of conversations about nursing process versus clinical judgment. It doesn't have to be versus. They can be, they can work really nicely together. The point of clinical judgment and clinical reasoning is that we're trying to teach them that there's thinking behind the nursing process and what that thinking is. We're, you know, and we're just trying to teach them the thinking. We can use the nursing process as a vehicle as well. We can put them, you know, they can go hand in hand, but we're trying to really hone in on the cognitive components of that decision-making process. And we're trying to help them understand that it's not always necessarily a very linear process. So sometimes you're noticing at the same time as you're interpreting and responding, like, it, you know, it, it's, it's very much a fluid type of process when it's in practice, nursing's messy. Right, care planning can be nice and neat, but nursing is messy. So, anyway, so back to Laster's clinical judgment rubric. So then we use, 
I use my concept mapping activity and as an evaluation tool, and then I fill in that information in the correct area of the CET. So now that kind of leads us to using concept mapping for assessment and evaluation. Um, it's a really useful tool. We do want our students to, uh, to develop clinical judgment, but we're trying to see where they're at and how far they've come. So this, um, <clears throat> in a way, concept mapping, because you can get something actual tangible, you're able to see what, they're, what they've learned, see where they're at with making these connections. Um, <clears throat> concept maps have been used in other disciplines, even in place of testing. Can you imagine that? Wouldn't that be something? They feel like it is so effective to see how much students have learned that they don't need an exam. They just have them do a concept map. Um, but one way we can use a concept map is to evaluate learning in the middle or the end of class. So in the middle of class, you can ask students to draw a quick concept map that explains a point or maybe a few points from class that they wanna connect. You could give them a specific topic or let them choose. They could exchange concept maps with each other, evaluate each other's concept maps. They could ask questions based on their concept maps. So if they're looking at their concept map and they're like, these two things connect, but I can't do that third part of a concept map and explain the connection. Hey, what, can someone tell me how these two things connect? They could ask each other, they could ask you. So it's a really great way to you know, identify points that need to be clarified and to clarify them. Concept mapping can also be used for a student's self-assessment. Self-assessments are valuable tools for students because it encourages introspection and reflection. And remember, reflection is part of doing really good clinical judgment. We want nurses who are internally motivated and driven, reflective of their own practice, and are able to develop a healthy self-assessment practice. So that way they will catch errors in their thinking and they will remedy them before they become a patient error. When my students complete the concept mapping clinical, I always teach them how to self-assess. I ask them to write the sentences that explains each connection, and I tell them if they cannot write a sentence, then I let them know con to consider whether or not they understand the connection or challenge them to consider that that might not be a good connection. This is really important. Have you ever seen students that like just go on and on and on and on and on? Like I have some in clinical right now that are like, yeah, I saw this and I saw this and I think this is happening and this is happening and da, 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 da. And then before you know it, they're completely off topic. And I'm like, no, let's concept map. What directly connects to this point right here and why? You need to learn how to focus on those things. That is the most important data. You talk about these direct connections and you let some of these other things go for now because we're prioritizing and a toe infection might not be the priority, but this edema and the shortness of the breath and this pulse ox of 80% right now might be the priority. <clears throat> All right, so let's see. <clears throat> Finally, I want to share a rubric with you guys. Um, hold on one second, guys. Oh, uh, developed for concept mapping learning activities. So this was actually really cool. The rubric is based on Tanner's clinical judgment model, noticing, interpreting, responding, and reflecting. So I think it's really a great example of how you can use a clinical judgment model as a framework. The rubric is called the clinical judgment self-evaluation rubric. Students use the rubric to assess their learning via the concept mapping activity. So noticing, students consider with the rubric, they have a noticing section. So students are considering if the concept map helps them focus their observation or notice important patterns. So I actually want to show you guys a few things here. So I will talk you through this rubric in just a moment. First, this is a concept map. And I want you to look at it just for a moment. You don't have to you know, answer right now, but Think about what this concept map tells you about the student's thinking. This is how we can assess and evaluate their learning. Look at the things they chose to put on their concept map. Look at what they decided to connect with what. So this concept map, this student is saying that dehydration is directly connected with viral gastroenteritis. There's a direct connection because that is the first connection that is made here. 
They're also saying that they saw um, hypertension at some point and they felt like that was connected, but it was like off to the side and at first they weren't quite sure how it was connected. What they figured out eventually is that they were getting a lot of IV fluids to replace this dehydration. And if you look at the directional link, the arrows pointing from the IV fluids to the hypertension, they figured out that they think the cause of the hypertension was these IV fluids. So we were able to have a conversation then. It's, we were like, okay, um, we think we have a problem. We might be giving too many IV fluids because they were dehydrated, but now we're uh, hypertensive. And this patient, you know, has this, you know, maybe they had congestive heart failure or whatnot too. And so they're a little bit more prone to developing hypertension. So it helped to lead what um, actions that they felt like they should take next. All right, now this is the rubric that I was telling you guys about that you can use to evaluate um, concept mapping. So students can use it to evaluate their own concept map, or you can use it as the educator to evaluate the learning from their concept map. So I just show you a piece of it because it was like a few pages, but if, to find it, it's in the Geardemitt et al. 2013 um, reference. But this right here is the noticing, but they also have an interpreting section where students are thinking about how they've organized their ideas. There's a responding section to evaluate whether or not um, the decision-making helped them to make decisions and reflection to try to figure out their own growth and what they've learned from uh, the concept mapping activity. <clears throat> All right, so now I would like you guys to share your experiences. How have you used concept mapping before? Hi, Lisa. A couple of people have um, chatted that they have used concept maps. Oh, great in the chat. Oh, yes. Okay, perfect. I'll read through the chat. You're in the process of creating an assignment that involves creating a concept map. Perfect timing. Oh, that's great. I feel like we can, um, oh, I hope I get to save all these comments. They're so good. It's like iron sharpens iron. We just can, you know, help each other with all these different ideas. I've used concept maps and clinical study tools and as quizzes. That I would like to hear about, Lynn. That is interesting. Do you have a um, rubric that are, you use uh, to grade the uh, concept map to get their grade or? Feel free to pop it in the chat. <clears throat> that sounds interesting. <clears throat> okay, so yes, yeah, she uses a rubric. Oh, I'd love to see that. I have used concept mapping using a new rubric tool. Oh, yes. If you have a resource or a reference to that, to the rubric tool that you use, that would be great. I'm like, I feel like if you could kill two birds with one stone, all the better. If I could use the concept mapping as a learning and teaching tool, and then if I could also um, use it to evaluate. Oh, these are great ideas. I hope there's a way to, um, uh, you know, keep sharing and uh, connect each other if we want to keep exchanging ideas. So then, just wanted to revisit this a moment and just again you know we've talked about different concept mapping ideas we've shared some ideas there's so much that we can work from here um uh, just again to highlight to you know make sure that we're considering those uh components of clinical judgment and how whatever learning activity we're using we're able to really hone in and tailor and you know, help them build these individual components 
Um, this figure I wanted to show you guys, it's not in the slides that you guys probably have. Some, it's hard for me not to add these last minute nuggets, um, but I did put the whole entire uh, reference right on the slide and I can always make this available later. But um, there are some tips and strategies to successful implement, implementation of concept mapping activities, such as considering the learner's ability, making sure that you provide a context. So you can even use it as problem-based learning, you know, give a patient scenario. Your patient has such and such and such, this is happening. You can use it with a case study, for example. Let's develop the concept map. Um, make sure you have enough time for this. Concept mapping takes some time. If you're really like diving into it, I mean, a good half an hour really you could use. You could do a quick version, but like it could take some time. And make sure you have clear instructions. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to share was a um, the data to diagnosis learning activity. So this is my clear instructions for concept mapping when we're doing that learning activity during clinical. So this is also available to you guys, but I mean, you could use it, you could tweak it, whatever you want, but um, just, you know, when they were talking about things that help with um, implementing concept mapping, clear instruction was one of them. So I have like a, you know, that is my example. All right, so other things to consider is, you know, where's your struggling, your student struggling most with those aspects. Um, consider the level of the student, first year versus second year. Maybe you want to simplify it a little bit for those earlier students. Um, also, when you're using the concept map, ask them high level questions to reveal more concepts. Have them dive in a little bit deeper. Um, other things to consider is, do you have more than one student with the same question? Maybe we could do a group concept mapping activity versus an individual student activity. Um, you know, also consider the learning environment. What resources do you have available? In clinical, we don't have like a whiteboard handy, so I have them just do it on an individual piece of paper. Um, in the classroom, though, I have the chalkboard, the whiteboard, the PowerPoint presentations going. So those kinds of things as well to help us. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is go into breakout rooms for just a few minutes um, and have a case study and have us talk about, you know, this is your case study. So here's your student example. And then um, talk about how could you use concept mapping to help the student? How could you evaluate the student's understanding? <clears throat> so those of you who have Nearpod, you're, attack, you're going in Nearpod, then you have this on your screen. I also included this as the slides. So you have this on your slide if you're not in Nearpod. So what I want you guys to do, I'm gonna put you in great breakout rooms is to read through this and then to answer these questions. Give me just a moment to figure out. Oh, I think I have to stop share to put you guys in breakout rooms. And I'm gonna leave a few um, people here with me. All right, so does anybody not mind staying with me? Because we're going to do this together. I don't mind. It's OK, me. perfect. Yeah, okay, good. Lynn will say. Oh, good. OK, good. All right, so and then Sabrina, you raised your hand. You'll stay too. All right, so you guys go ahead and stay with me. We'll do this together. And then everybody else, go ahead in your breakout room. And we'll spend a few minutes. Hmm. Am I staying or going? Let's see. Because you said join five, but I volunteer to stay. So I can oh, join. Oh, stay, five. stay, stay. I had okay. to. Like it made me make you okay. go to room. Okay. So those of us, everybody else stay. Thank you guys for staying. All right. So one of the students is struggling to understand how his patient's fluid status relates to their electrolyte imbalance. They notice numerous abnormal findings such as hyperatremia, elevated lactic acid level, low blood pressure, patient has diarrhea, he has failure to thrive, enteral tube feedings. Um, he also notes that the patient has an acute kidney injury, but can't remember what that means. So how could we use concept mapping to help the student? And how could we evaluate the student's understanding? So we talked about a lot of different concept mapping strategies. 
Is this a more um, entry level student or um, more this, senior? For me, this is like a second year student, okay. but it might be, it could be an entry level. That's a good idea. We got to consider the level of student. Let's say it's Great. an entry level student and they just kind of know fluid balance and electrolyte maybe. Could you um, do like um, have them do a symptom concept map and then um, kind of link it to the, the diagnoses that are in there? That probably would work. Yes. So like start with the symptoms. Maybe they can put the symptoms on a note card at first. And then um, we could start, we could have the, um, so we have a few problems here. So I guess we would have to like decide which one we're connecting it to. So they've right. got like failure to thrive and then they've got acute kidney injury as well. Now, if you mm -hmm. have a beginning level student, I wonder if you would want to try to focus on like something like failure to thrive. What other thoughts do you guys have? You might want to focus more on the fluid and electrolyte imbalance and then go, you know, with an, a more entry level student. Yes. Okay. So, there. so that's a good idea. So start with like you pick the topic. So if you have this patient, then we might be like, okay, guys. In theory, we talked about fluid and electrolytes. Mm -hmm. Boom. We're going to start there. What can we connect with imbalanced fluid and electrolytes? That does sound good. And then they could do the almost, uh, well, this one caused this one. And, you know, they could do the directional things once they mm -hmm. understood the basic things. Yes, that's true. That would be good. Yeah, I know for my students, I always tell them if they can figure out like the directional can be important because if they can kind of figure out what caused what, then they know where to focus their interventions on. Because mm -hmm. then if they can identify that underlying like issue. <clears throat> Any other thoughts? about prioritizing? Could they do some prioritizing at that level? Yes. Sure. So they could put their um, fluid and electrolytes in the middle, some of their assessment findings, mm -hmm. and then they could add some of their interventions, or I guess that could be a conversation if you guys wanted to say, okay, now that we have this, what ideas do you guys have for interventions? And yes. also additional assessments, you know, there are a lot of physical assessments they would need to complete on this patient other than just looking at labs. Yes. Okay. That sounds good too. Good. Now, how would you guys evaluate the student understanding? I kind of would want to hear the student explain their concept mm -hmm. map to me to mm -hmm. really get a good idea. I like that. I, sometimes I notice like, you know, you'll be in class or even when you're, you're talking, if you do all the talking with the student, then they're like, uh huh, that makes sense. Uh huh, uh huh. And then if they try to do it, they're like, oh, wait, I lost it. Can you say that again? <laughs> like, if there is a difference when they're listening to you explain it than when they're trying to explain it themselves, right? I like the way that you add all that, a lot of narrative on, you know, in the, on the perimeters of your concept map, um, that that's really helpful. I think it's helpful in assessing their thought process, but it's also helpful for the student to kind of quantify, well, why did I come up with this? You know, what am I thinking? Yes. I, I like that. I, I don't really, I'm going to encourage more of that. And I, and that's why I feel like too, I'm going to, um, give everybody the one minute warning. But um, that's why I try to encourage that safe learning environment too, because mm -hmm. for that to happen, they have to feel safe with you because nobody wants yes. to look like they don't know what they're talking about. You know what I mean? And if they're kind of like getting tripped up over that narrative piece of it and explaining, then um, 
then they need to feel safe in that learning environment. So that's why I feel that context is so important. But good. Well, thank you guys for staying with me to do the activity with me. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that was very great. helpful. Welcome back, everybody. We're coming back. Um, I always plan more. I don't know about you guys, but I always plan more act learning activities just in case we actually have extra time because I never want to be like looking at each other, not knowing what to do next. So we will not have time to get to the last learning activity, but um, I do have just this last slide implementation strategies in the last few minutes I want to have for questions and conversation. But basically when, you know, I saw in the chat, a lot of people are already starting to develop concept mapping and learning activities or you've already developed them. So I'm sure you're familiar with just steps to developing a learning activity. But basically, you know, think about what your purpose is for your concept map. Are you trying to do teaching learning moments or assessment evaluation? And then you create the activity with these components in mind. Um, the one thing I really want to highlight is make time for that discussion and feedback because like you guys identified at the very beginning, sometimes it's not even at that moment when the situation is happening, but it's when you're sitting back talking about it. So that's when the learning happens. Um, and then also reflect, you know, after the first few times you do the activity or whatnot, how did it help your students? Do you feel like you need to tailor the activity or tweak it a little bit more to make it more effective to develop clinical judgment? Or do you feel like it's just fine the way it is? But so that's pretty much it. And like I said, I always plan more, um, more, act, you know, activities than we necessarily will have time to do just, just in case. But I do have a um, learning activity that you guys can work on in your meetings or individually or however you want to do it. You know, it's, you have access to on your own, but I wanted to see if you guys had any questions or like final thoughts. This was very helpful. Thank you. Um, I especially appreciate the uh, rubrics for concept map. I think that's a great idea. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. And I do include like my contact information too. Um, man, some of you guys have some great ideas. I would love to connect with you guys as well, honestly, um, to get X, you know, to share some of your rubrics. <clears throat> I know somebody had a rubric already, it sounded like. So that's such a good idea. To have that already built. Yeah, the one that I shared was in a, a journal article. So I have those resources. So any questions or about anything that quick question. Did you say you were going to share this the slides with us or? Okay, so I'm glad I saved that. Let me um, show you guys what, um, let me see, I have it pulled up just in case. So on the events area, um, you can click into this presentation and there are handouts available. Okay. Let me throw it in just to make it easier for you. I'll throw it in the chat. You could just click. All right, so if you click there, then there is the uh, description, learning outcomes, and the handout. So the lesson plan that I showed you guys is there, the concept mapping student activity, how we do it. The template is there. I, mean, I think I have two templates there. And then one of them was a learning activity that you could do to design a concept mapping activity. And then it's like a guide to help design a concept mapping activity. And then the last one is the concept mapping presentation handouts. Oh, good, Vera. You, you're back with us? How strange. <laughs> Technology is weird sometimes. And Lisa, if I may say something very quickly, um, I just see this as such a powerful tool, the concept map, and that we come together um, to work on, especially the case study you shared with us, just seeing how students think through the process and what's the why behind the what, you know, just so powerful that even if they're having challenges, we're able to get into their world and then bring them out, you know, of the struggling and bring them into the light, right, of where they should be. And this is just so powerful. 
Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, thank you. I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's, it, you know, before you guys were coming back in my group, we were talking just about how, you know, you're really getting to the heart of what students thinking and how we were saying one way to evaluate is just let them talk through their concept map. And I was saying, we were like, how powerful is that safe learning environment? Because they really need to feel safe to be able to feel like they can express themselves. Because sometimes it's almost like you see your students and they're all quiet, right? But one thing I like about journals and concept maps is it's a way to bring out what's inside outside a little bit. And sometimes it feels safer for them just to write it down, rather than have like participate so much in class or whatnot. Some students are just more quieter, but it is, it is really a beautiful process to kind of feel like they are bringing who they are in themselves. But like, you know, we were saying that, you know, just make sure you have this really safe learning environment that they feel like they could do it. I know for me, I always tell a lot of new nurse stories. I'm like, Y'all think you're, you know, don't ever feel bad. Like you don't know what's going on. Let me tell you what it was like to be a new nurse. Like just to let them know that they're, you know, being a, a new person, we were all there and we were all so vulnerable and it's just this human experience we can have together. So yeah, thank you for sharing. Well, so I think that's it. We're at time now, guys. So I know we got another meeting to go to, right? Some of us. <laughs> it was so great to spend time with you guys.